criminal psychology is the application of psychology to criminal law. There are two branches of law, two main branches. One is civil law and criminal law. In civil law, it involves actions taken by one citizen against another citizen, for example, a lawsuit for personal injury, a family law matter, a matter of civil competency to determine if someone is able to make a will or, or consent to medical treatment. But in criminal law, that's an offense that takes place against the state, against the state that you live in, the federal government, or whatever jurisdiction you're in. And there what happens is you have someone called a prosecutor who is bringing charges against you for committing some type of crime. And there's a whole list of crimes depending on whether they're state crimes, federal crimes, and they will make a charge against you of that crime. The role of the defense attorney, obviously, is to defend you. The Constitution guarantees your right to a fair trial. That includes the right to your jury by a peers, to be able to confront the witnesses against you, and to participate in your own defense. And one of the areas that psychology gets involved in is determining if you're competent to stand trial. So, for example, if you're unable to understand the charges against you, if you're unable to understand the range of possible penalties that may apply, and if you're not able to assist your attorney in your own defense, you may be determined to be not competent to stand trial. And so what a forensic psychologist would do in that circumstance would be to have an in-depth interview with that defendant, would have a, uh, an, a, administer certain psychological tests and measurements, review the records that are related to the case, and if that person is determined not to be able to understand the nature of the crime that they've committed, the range of possible penalties, or be able to assist their own counsel, they may be declared not competent to stand trial. The question then is what happens to them? Um, typically what happens is if they're so severely impaired that they're not competent to stand trial, there may be a motion for involuntary civil commitment. That is, to remand that person to a facility to treat them until such time as they're able to be competent to stand trial. Now there are going to be some conditions where a person will simply permanently not be able to stand trial. A person has had a severe brain injury. They have a dementia. They suffered all their life from mental retardation. These are not things that are going to improve with treatment. Uh, however, some conditions such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, transient psychiatric conditions that have a cycle to them, these are something that may be treatable. And in that case, the goal will be to treat the individual until they're mentally able to understand the criteria for competency to stand trial. The other issue is the difference between being able to understand and simply having that knowledge. Many times a defendant may not have the answer to these questions, not because there's anything wrong with them, they simply don't know. And most courts now have what are called competency restoration courses or competency restoration classes, which is essentially a little seminar where somebody comes in and explains to them the rules of, of, of trial procedure, what's involved, and so on. Uh, if someone is declared to be permanently not competent to stand trial, then uh, they may either be released if they're not considered to be a danger to self or others, or again, they may be, uh, there may be a motion for involuntary civil commitment if they're considered to be dangerous. And that's another area where psychologists will get into in, in, in the criminal justice system. How do you determine if somebody's dangerous? What does that actually mean? It typically means, are they likely to reoffend? And how do you know that? Well, we know one principle of psychology in general. For most people, the best prediction of future behavior is past behavior. If you've had a certain pattern of behavior in the past that's been repetitive, you're more likely to do it again than, than to do something else. So one of the things we look at are whether or not the condition that has formed the basis for incompetency to stand trial is something that's likely to lead to what we call recidivism, which is a repeat of the crime. That may not always be the case. Uh, but if that is, then we need to know about that. And there are certain test measures, psychometrics, clinical interview, reviewing records that psych a psychologist will sit down and then render an opinion. The third main area is what's called the insanity defense, or not guilty by reason of insanity. And here, here's where there's been a lot of, of, of uh, misunderstanding and confusion. After the uh, attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan by, by John Hinckley back in the 80s, uh, he was actually acquitted on the basis of not guilty by reason of insanity. This led to a great protest. We're letting these people just get off on insanity defenses left and right. It's almost like half the people that go to trial must get off on an insanity defense. The statistics are a lot different. The insanity defense is only invoked in about one out of every hundred felony cases. So in only about one out of hundred felony cases where the case is going to go to trial is the insanity defense even raised. In about half those cases, the defense 
counsel looks at the defendant. The prosecution looks at the defendant. They both conclude this guy is seriously mentally ill. There's no way that this person is going to be found guilty. So they basically cut a deal. They, they, they agree that the defendant is, is not guilty by reason of insanity. That leaves us with one half of 1% of cases where you actually have this kind of battle of the experts that you see on TV where you know, one suit comes in and says the guy's perfectly normal. One suit comes in and says the guy's stark staring nuts. And they battle back and forth. That happens very rarely. And when it does, juries tend to agree with the insanity verdict in about half the time, half the cases, and with, uh, with, uh, not with a guilty, a guilty verdict in the other half of cases. So you've got now one out of every 400 felony cases where following this traditional battle of the experts is the subject, does the subject get off by reason of insanity? So, so it's, not a, it's not the kind of defense that's likely to be successful. Uh, not only that, let's say you're found not guilty by reason of insanity. Remember what we said before. After you're adjudicated not competent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity, they don't simply open the courthouse door, say, have a nice day, and let you go. The question is, and the problem is, if you have a mental disorder so severe that you were not sane at the time you committed that crime, and we'll talk about what those criteria are in a moment, then you're obviously too dangerous to be just let out. So almost inevitably, you're going to be remanded to some type of treatment facility where you may end up spending more time in that psychiatric facility than you would have spent had you been found guilty. Because the criteria for release is that you no longer are a danger based on this mental illness. And if you have a mental illness which is difficult to treat, it may be difficult to treat because of the nature of the illness, or it may be difficult to treat because you as a defendant are not compliant with the treatment. And that's, that's the main case. A lot of times what will happen is it's easy to give a prescription for a neuroleptic or an antipsychotic for somebody with, let's say, with paranoid schizophrenia. But are they going to follow it? So if they've been out on, on um, conditional release and they're not following their medication, they become psychotic again, the court is going to haul them back in and they're going to say, look, we gave you a chance. Now, you, now you're going to be our guest or the guest of a facility that we choose until such time as the doctors who are clucking over you determine that you're now fit to be released. And that may be a very, very long time. <laughs>